So it doesn't seem to work. But I mean, it's a local setting, so every remote participant. No, I think the camera is. No, no, I think the camera is. So it should by default detect who is speaking. Well, but but it, but it's not. But it did. But the audio test seems to work. But it did that earlier. We don't know if it actually works in there. But uh, it's not. Oh. Well, it did it earlier. Maybe we're not showing the right. The bar is selected. No, no. I think it's just showing the wrong. I mean, it's just on this screen. It's showing. Adi, I thought you pre present from this one. I'm going to be doing that for the Zoom because of the demo. Oh, sorry. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's fine. It's just not showing on here. Uh, but that's okay. For some reason, it's showing the host instead of the, the speaker. Yeah, 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 but that's fine. It's fine. Uh, we could even get rid of that, but uh, that's why I'm trying to do it. So, if anyone asks questions or anything in the chat, we'll see. Well, yeah. cool. yeah. we have this camera. This yeah. camera, right? Yeah. 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 So, uh, well, we could put the chat on and show the chart and see if we can put, put that in a little window here. So that is all of my controversies. Wollt ihr es vielleicht so drehen, dass man den Speaker gibt? Hm? Weil im Moment schaut es einfach nur auf mein Ohr. <lacht> only, but only when you're talking, I think. So oh. could move it a bit like that. So then I think it's... So it shows a bit of the chat. Maybe just All right, hi, Mark, are you able to hear us? Great, thanks. Let's see 
questions. Okay. So it seems that we are all set up now. So we are. Um, I just want to say welcome to everyone. Uh, to Lester. I uh, hope you had a good trip and everything worked uh, out so far. Um, so apart from if you technical problems with the screen, everything else should, should be um, okay as well. Um, I don't really have much to announce, but uh, uh, I guess the only thing is um, if you're joining any Zoom sessions, which you may do at the presenter or chair or host or anything like that, when the meeting, please keep your audio off. So join without audio, yeah? otherwise you get interesting echoes, which, which, which we don't need. Um, we booked a restaurant uh, for those who registered that they want to join the, the informal workshop dinner tonight. Now yeah, we'll let you know. Uh, uh, where that is. We may have days before one or two more, um, but really you should have filled the form and told you. <laughs> uh, but if, if if for any some reason you didn't fill the form and you really want to join, then, then let us know what we be able to do that. Um, yeah, otherwise, uh, I don't think I have anything important to say now. So I'm going to over to Jens to start. Thanks, Brian. Hello, everybody, and a very warm welcome to this year's edition of GCM. Uh, nice to meet all of you. I'm Jens from the University of Kassel in Germany, also still affiliated with the University of Marburg. And Toby, my co-chair, is unfortunately missing. He had important obligations uh, by his work, so he wasn't able to join us here. He has to visit a conference in Paris, but maybe he will join us remotely if his timetable is. So we have an interesting program today. The important thing is, or one important thing is that uh, we will join the tech keynote. They have a very interesting speaker. I'm looking forward to this. So for the next session after the coffee break, we have to change the room and we'll join the TED keynote you know, with Michael Larson. Uh, our last session is intended to be more of a workshop-like session. So we will have four lightning talks, very short, just giving interesting new ideas, um, very short discussion afterwards, and then after something like half an hour, we would like to start um, yeah, having a more interactive session, discussion about interesting research topics, if there are breakout groups, that would also be fine. So it's intended to be a real workshop session, not um, in the conference style. I'm looking forward to, uh, to that. And I think in the keynote session, we will probably get lots of some more information about the welcome reception, but it's also everything documented on the staff website. And Raiko already mentioned the GCM workshop after party. So it's a nice tradition that the people visiting GCM meet at the evening and just share dinner, talk, catch up. So um, as Raiko already said, if you haven't registered, uh, it wouldn't be possible for a few people to still join. Just to say about the welcome reception, there's not, nothing really to say about that, except that you're all welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's in the coffee area where, where we will have coffee. The only problem with the GCM workshop after party is that you have to pay for your own dinner. It's not part of the official program, but I mean, you have to buy dinner anyhow, so. We had a very nice and strong program committee. So it was really a joy to work with these guys and women, a very smooth brief review process. And I think also a very, constructive feedback for the papers. It was really nice. Just very brief statistics. We had uh, five, uh, have accepted five regular submissions out of six. 
and uh, all four submissions for lightning talks. Um, the contributions are from Germany, Japan, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, UK, US. And uh, for the uh, participants, at least as far as I could see from the email addresses, from Denmark, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Netherlands, Singapore, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, UK, and US. So it's really great. It's not merely, I mean, the center of the workshop is European, but it's really international. Very nice. Welcome, everybody. One quick notice, uh, this meeting is being recorded. So we are streaming to allow for remote participants and also uh, two of the lightning talks and one regular talk will be um, remote talks. And we, also, we are also live streaming on YouTube and um, all the talks, all the sessions will be available at the Greta YouTube channel. So in case, so you, the, on the papers, I mean, I think asking before, so it's, it's, do we already know how to access the full paper if somebody wants to want to look right now? Okay. Is that possible? Yeah. Oh, no, let me okay. check it out. Okay, thanks. Uh, and I can also, I think in the lunch time, I could also upload the individual papers yeah. and Maybe put a link in the group. Follow right now. Yeah. Possible. Yeah, let me let me check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. is out. Artu, Artu, can you say where the papers are, where the proceedings are? Yes, the proceedings are on the uh, drive on the page, and links and an on the uh, news page. Ah, oh, uh, great. Each proceeding, proceeding of each conference and the full drive will be in the world. Uh, uh, Check, Thank you. Check the news on the conference page. Okay. Yeah, but a uh, quick uh, last remark on um, being recorded. So if you don't like that, but still want to ask a question, just join the Zoom channel and use the chat and then the program, uh, the session share or somebody else can read it out loud. But it's a great thing, so you can watch the talks again. So uh, then I will hand over to Dedlin. Okay, thanks. Yes. So good morning, everybody. We have two talks in this first session. Uh, we'll start with a talk by the group of Anishur and uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a system description of the Gibbs system, and it may be a follow up paper of last year's GCM yes, thing. Yes. Yeah, it is. Okay, that's great. And the uh, presenter will be Maximilian Kratz. I think that's what I say at the moment. Right, um, welcome to our short paper presentation. My name uh, is Maximilian Kratz, and this is joint work with Sebastian Yemus, Philip Menzel, and Anitur. And the system description paper we want uh, to present to you is the title What is Prism Red Prototyping for Control Algorithms with the Gibbs Framework? So let's first start with our example scenario, which is Lecture Studio. Lecture Studio is a tool for um, remote presenting slides and live streaming lectures. It is free and open source and it gets developed at the Technical University of Darmstadt. Um, all right. Yeah, the screens are not shared. Ah, okay. Then, second.
this one right? So it's this one, the one before. Right? Which one is this one? This is just, just a slide. That's what you feel. Yes, screen. That's what you Yeah, because it shows the action the whole screen. So now that we changed screens, it shows something different. Oh, okay. All right. So um, the benefit of using Lecture Studio for streaming your lectures compared to, like, for example, Zoom is uh, that. Lecture Studio, um, the whole set of PDF slides gets transferred to, to each, to each participating client at the start of the lecture. Therefore, um, during the lecture itself, only small deltas like, for example, with laser pointer actions or slide change actions uh, must be transmitted to the um, clients. The benefit of this is that we can optimize the bandwidth consumption of the Lecture Studio streaming system. Um, but we have the downside, namely, uh, we have to transmit possibly a large PDF uh, file at the beginning of the lecture to all clients in short amount. So, um, this is how it looks like uh, in our current setup. First, the PDF file gets transferred to the Lecture Studio server. We want to optimize the bandwidth distribution of this file to um, all clients. And Currently, the file will be transferred to each client individually. Some transmissions uh, take a lot of time, some are faster. And at the end, every client has the PDF uh, slide set and the lecture can be here. So our idea is to use a peer-to-peer -peer data distribution system to allow the clients um, to redistribute the PDF slide from one client to the other. And, um, and this stage, we have a the first task, which is find all pairs of clients that are able to um, distribute the PDF slide set. So in our example, we have these lines. So for example, the client on the upper left may distribute the file to our, uh, the other three clients. Uh, we want now to filter some of these um, connections to reduce the number of connect possible connections. And we want to use incremental graph pattern matching for this. So we want to apply some conditions. So for example, the bandwidth of the sending client should uh, be larger or equal to the bandwidth of the receiving client. And we want to apply some negative communication conditions, like for example, if a client is already connected to the uh, network, we do not want to connect it again. So we have a few possibilities to build this connection tree. In our first example, um, we have these three lines here. And we have a whole, uh, the complete transmission time of five time steps, um, but we have an optimization problem. So we want, for example, to minimize the transmission time. Another possible tree would be this one with uh, a total transmission time of four time steps if the sending order is properly chosen. And the last one would be, for example, this with uh, a total transmission time of three time steps. So we have to select these pairs of uh, nodes in our network in order to optimize the transmission time. The resulting topology would look something like this. And once again, in the first step, the presenter transfers the slide to the lecture studio server. The server can redistribute the file to the first client. And now the lecture studio server and the relay client are able to distribute time. And we have transferred the file to all participating clients in three time steps compared to the six time steps we had before. Um, yeah, also we are, we are able to um, cut the bandwidth usage of the lecture studio server in half because the relay client um, distributes the file to two other clients. Okay, so for our optimization problem, we need an objective. So for our example, we want to minimize the send time for all relay clients connected to the lecture studio server and for all normal servers um, just streaming the lecture connected to the lecture studio server. So in our example, we want to minimize the sum of both send times um, and we can formulate as a mathematical equation like that. 
Maybe we want to also place additional constraints on our network. So arbitrary constraint would be, for example, um, that the total time needed for the clients connected to uh, the relay clients, the ones down below, uh, should be less or equal to the total time needed uh, to transmit the file clients directly connect to the server, so write to clients. And the motivation for this would be, for example, that the clients participating in the um, peer to peer system should not wait longer uh, compared uh, to when they connected directly. So uh, we can formulate this as an, as an mathematical inequality like the left. And we can see that one term, the send term for the relay clients, the uh, send time for the relay clients is uh, present on both sides of the inequality. Therefore, we can simplify our constraint and get. Now, um, to sum up, we have these challenges. We want to find and maintain a valid peer to peer topology incrementally, so on the fly. And therefore, we have to find pairs of nodes with incremental graph pattern matching, as I showed before. Um, we want the next step we want to select pairs of these nodes in order to optimize a given cost function, like, for example, distribution time or the bandwidth consumption. We do not want to implement this um, algorithm manually, uh, but we want an integrated framework which gives support for rapid prototyping. Um, and we also want to be able to generate runtime code um, in order to evaluate the prototype and um, yeah, play around with it. Um, there are some approaches from literature that we can use to implement such a system. So we, for example, can use um, transformation orchestration and use uh, a search-based um, algorithm, for example, a genetic algorithm, or we can use uh, other model transformation frameworks that, for example, use SMT solvers. Um, some of them uh, also provide a custom domain-specific language for the constraint part. And last but not least, we can use so-called model healing with the utility improvements to optimize the model. But there are some downsides. So for example, the search-based algorithm um, cannot guarantee optimality for our system. The SMT solver-based approach um, cannot optimize the given cost function or our objective function. And last but not least, the searching for uh, graph transformation sequences to optimize the model may be slow. So our approach is to use our uh, GIPS framework, and GIPS stands for Graph-Based LP Problem Specification Tool. And with this tool, we want to give the users a convenient uh, way to specify graph mapping or graph optimization problems, but without the need for IP expertise or another optimization technique. And we want to provide this with as little implementation effort as possible. And therefore, we created a new domain-specific language for the specifications part, which we call Gipsel, which is short for Gips language. And the framework or tool is then able to generate IP generator using a given specification um, and the LP generator can calculate valid uh, solutions for our optimization problem. So we consider Gibbs a tool to build other tools. And the overall goal is um, to give the developer support for rapid prototyping and also generate uh, executable Java code so that we can evaluate our prototypes. OK, how does the tool work in essence? We have the Gibbs specification part on top consists uh, of a meta model for our model instances, uh, a set of graph transformation rules with the corresponding left-hand sides. And we can also place uh, constraints on the rule and pattern elements. So we can um, yeah, give away how these uh, rules, uh, rule applications interact with each other. Furthermore, we can also place constraints on the model elements directly. And last but not least, we can specify an objective function we want to optimize, like, for example, the transmission time in our network. For the run of the framework, we first need uh, an instance model. So for example, we need um, an instance of our um, network model. We fed this into the pattern matcher, which gives us a set of rule matches um, through this corresp corresponding left-hand sides of our graph transformation rules. And these into uh, our Gibbs core, which is then able to formulate a valid IoT problem. Um, the IoT problem gets solved by an IoT solver, which gives us uh, a set of rule applications uh, that uh, guarantee that the model would uh, be yeah, optimized according to the objective function. 
rough transformation is then able to um, yeah, deploy these changes and the output is uh, a modified model, which is optimal, um, um, yeah, corresponding to our objective and the constraints. And if we want to, we can start the cycle all over again. Okay, so how do we implement such a topology control algorithm? Um, such an algorithm can generate a model as a so-called self-healing system. And a common approach of the self-healing or self-adaptive systems community is the so-called make k loop. The make k loop, we have a set of managed elements down below. So the set consists of the lecture studio server and all participating clients. And on top of this, uh, we have a control loop, which consists of multiple blocks. The first block is the knowledge block, which um, holds information about the network transformation part. Um, the monitor block um, yeah, monitors the managed elements and gives this um, collected data to the analyze block, which analyzes the data. The plan block um, is then able to construct an adaption plan, and the execute block uh, would deploy this uh, plan to the system. So with our GIPS um, yeah, tool, we would model something like this. In our um, knowledge block, we have a model instance, uh, which is an instance of the Eclipse modeling framework. Uh, our monitor block would normally collect the input data of the actual system, but since we are just simulating our clients, we just build a bridge that um, connects our simulation GIPS. Uh, In the analyze um, block, we use a pattern matcher to find our matches for the left-hand side of the graph transformation rules. The plan block um, then uses an IOP solver um, to construct the adaption plan. And finally, the execute block consists of a graph transformation engine, uh, which is a Mufflin IBEX GT to deploy the chain, these chains. Okay, so for our model uh, instance in the knowledge base, we need a meta model. And the simplified meta model used in our example looks like this. Uh, on the top right, we have um, a class network. It consists of multiple lectures to your servers. Um, each lecture studio server has um, a data block, which um, is the model of the PDF slide set we want to transfer with a certain size. Um, the lecture studio server also contains a set of clients down below, and the clients are connected via um, internet connections with a certain bandwidth, for example. And the role of our um, yeah, example is to find valid peer-to-peer -peer connection links between the clients, and we want to also determine which of the clients should be a relay client we distribute in the file. Okay, so now to our demonstration. Um, we implemented this uh, and we put a small visualization. You can see here in the middle of the thing, we have the lectures to the server and two relay clients uh, and a set of uh, normal clients just streaming the lecture connected to both of them. And in the first step, one of the relay clients uh, left our stream. So for example, the internet connection broke down. And the task of the prototype is now to reconnect all of the floating clients in order uh, yeah, to reconnect it to the stream. And the prototype is able to formulate this as an IP problem, and the network uh, gets repaired. So one of the four clients um, was converted to a relay client, redistributing the file to the other clients. The next step, um, we also introduce a set of new clients drawn in the lecture, for example, in the night. And the prototype is once, able, uh, once again able to formulate this as a valid IP um, cons uh, problem and therefore reconnects all of the clients to the network. Okay, so since this is a workshop, we have built a small little virtual machine with the uh, framework, a pattern matcher, IP solver, the visualization, and an example implementation for the prototype. And we're happy, we would be happy if you download it and play around with it. Um, yeah, try, for example, different constraints. Um, okay. So now the question may arise, how does the prototype's runtime scale with the number of clients? So this toy example runs rather fast, but how does it scale with the larger number of clients? Um, to evaluate this, we've, um, we use the last um, step of our demonstration. So namely, the prototype has to calculate the topology to connect n new clients to the peer-to-peer -peer network. We want to do this incrementally, so we want to um, connect a subset of the new clients uh, at each time step. We do not want to migrate existing connections. So, for example, line eight, line eleven already have a connection, and we do not want to um, 
change this. And we also run these experiments like 10 times to calculate the mean and use our simulation system in the office. This slide shows the runtime of the prototype. So on the x axis, we have the number of clients from 5 to 100, and on the y axis, we have the runtime in seconds. And as you can already see, the runtime uh, scaling of the prototype is really bad. So the um, uh, prototype needs a lot of time to, for example, connect 100 uh, clients to the network. Um, the next thing one can see is that the most, uh, the, the largest part of the runtime the prototype needed was the uh, actually graph transformation part. So my name is the pattern matcher. Um, and this is because uh, in the prototypes implementation, we have some really complex graph patterns with multiple disjoint nodes. And yeah, it scales at least. <laughs> um, one you know what the, what the growth is uh, quadratic or inverse? Or at least think it is cubic? Cubic. So my first assumption would be that there was that it would be exponential, but we think it's cubic because we have patterns with like uh, three disjoint nodes. And yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, one thing to mention on this slide, if you implement the prototype uh, or if you implement another example, like for example, our scenario from last year, the ratio may be the other way around. So not every prototype you implement with our framework looks uh, the run the runtime looks like this. So in some cases, the IoT part is the heavy lifting and the GPT part is like in seconds. Okay, so for the conclusion, we've seen that GIPS is an excellent tool for rapid prototyping of graph-based optimization algorithms. And we can use our example implementation of the scenario for small to medium scale scenarios. In the future, we want to evaluate the lecture studio scenario with an actual test bed, and we want to use a mix of real and emulated clients to um, yeah, deploy the changes to an actual network and look how it behaves. Um, we want to further evaluate and test um, the Gibbs framework with uh, different scenarios. So, for example, we're currently working on um, a scenario which is the static task scheduling of software defined radio blocks. And in this scenario, we have like computational tasks of the software defined radio, and we want to map them to CPU cores in order to, for example, um, yeah, optimize the throughput of the software defined radio. Yeah, another big point on our to do list is the generation of valid GT sequences instead of sets, because currently uh, the Gibbs framework outputs a set of rule applications. And there is no guarantee that you can apply all of these GT applications without breaking, for example, a, a mesh of the following application. You can implement it when, um, if you use additional constraints in your specification part, but Gibbs does not uh, guarantee it uh, itself. And last but not least, we want to extend the expressiveness of the Gibbs language. So we want to introduce new language features, for example, the support for quadratic um, equations in the constraints and in the objective. And we want to introduce shortcuts design patterns for the specification part uh, and yeah, write maybe a little guide with best practices on how to implement it. And with this, I'm at the end of my talk. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Yeah, thank you. We have plenty of time for questions, so I hope there are some. Yeah. You, you mentioned that you use the ILP as opposed to SMP because SMP won't optimize for you. What do you think of these SMP solvers that also have an implementation of the facilities? Like in NASA, or Ah, so if if I understand it correctly, there are some SMT servers that can also optimize the given objective function. Yes. Wouldn't this then be an ILT solver? Uh, they handle the disjunctions uh, differently because you cannot directly specify disjunctions in the ILT solver. Ah, okay. Okay, then maybe we have to look at this one. Um, until now, I thought SMT solvers in general do not have an optimization. Um, Objective. Okay, thank you. So, which kind of root features do you support? You mentioned this problem of mm -hmm. having 
clickable sequences at the end. So you support deletion, max, everything in principle, but it uh, can just happen that if you use max and rules that delete, that the sequence isn't applicable at the end. Yes, exactly that. So we support all of the features that Emoflow IPEX GT supports. So um, adi uh, addition, deletion, uh, change of nodes or edges and attributes. And uh, yeah, it may be that the output uh, if you apply it like uh, you got the solution and one of the further steps would be not possible to apply anymore. Um, okay, so if you want to ensure that the um, application, uh, that you can apply all of the uh, rule applications in the set, you have to place additional constraints. Um, so that the IP solver finds a combination of applications that cannot be validated. Yes. That's a tricky question. <laughs> um, so um, if we want to ensure that this uh, set could be applied all the way, the runtime of the IP solver would rise or not. So I, I got what you intend, but uh, we do not really have a solution for this. So sometimes it is beneficial to find um, a way to get some of the load off of the graph transformation part to the IP solver or the other way around, but it is a hard problem to solve. So the complexity does not go away. Would it be possible to combine your tool with the well-known critical pair analysis, analysis and stuff like that? So uh, would this help if you already have certain static information about the rules which you need to apply first, which rules could be in conflict and which not? So maybe this would take some load. Yes, I think it would be possible. So, because in the last year's example, we had um, the problem that we needed to ensure a certain order of the application. And there we just implemented this with additional constraints. And I think it would be possible to generate these um, yeah, additional constraints like with critical pair analysis, for example. Yeah, also the question. So you're saying this is for prototyping? Yes. So if such a prototype then is to be developed into a final system? Yes. Um, I mean, are there any particular issues because you have this graph transformation approach? I mean, what would developers do? Would they look at the generated Java code or really at the graph transformation level? Or okay. Um, so we see this, um, as you already said, as a rapid prototyping tool. So um, our yeah, the benefit of using it um, compared to manual implementation is that you can like, for example, change your constraints, press one button, and then you uh, execute sure. a prototype yeah. um, will be generated. And we think um, if you want to, if you found your optimal solution, and you say, this is, these are the constraints I want to use, and this is the objective function, um, you can use the prototype, but we would um, yeah, um, say that you have to implement it by hand in order to optimize the run. So maybe you, uh, in some of the left-hand sides of some, uh, some patterns are just to find uh, pairs of nodes, for example, yeah. without further uh, attribute conditions or something like this. And you also can implement this with autograph transformation tool and it would faster. It would work. So the okay. developers ought to have some knowledge of graph transformation. Problem. Yeah, if that's they always want, an issue, right? If you, if you <laughs> if they want to use this tool for rapid prototyping, they should because they have to write the yeah. graph transformation rules by hand. They are part of the specification. Yes. Thanks again. It's me. Ah, yeah. Okay. okay, I can read it out if you want to. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, how long did it take you to specify the problem in Gibbs and to come up with a working prototype? That's an excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, that's cool. Okay. Um, if you 
used to use GIPS. And if you know how to specify graph transformation rules and how the GIPS language works, I would say you need a day to specify such a prototype. But you can see that the GIPS language isn't easy to run for people that, for example, don't know how to use graph transformation rules, right? And so therefore we want to create um, yeah, like a, a guide with best practices and kind of patterns to use. Um, but for example, um, and one story in my master thesis, yes. I manually wrote the test structure for last week, and I did it like three months to get everything working to manually collect yeah. on the drop and the IP solver. And after we finished our GIPS framework for the first run, runnable version of the GIPS framework, we were able to specify this in three hours or so. So I would say if you can. If you know how to use it, it's really fast, but it definitely takes some time to learn. So we need to stop sharing on this one, I think. No, it's not sharing here. Oh no, it's already showing. Now we see. Yeah. Okay. Everything ready? So, what? Okay. All right, so it's good to be back. As you guys know, I have been here before. I've, I've spent about five years here when I did my book, my master's, and my PhD here. So it's great to be back in England for a change. I'm originally from Canada, but I'm currently teaching at University of Haven, um, which is in the US. And basically, I wanted to connect teaching and research together because I've been doing teaching for so many years as after I left, I just kept teaching at all these different universities, but I really missed grad transformation. So I contacted right though and I said, okay, how do I make sure that I can teach people something that is going to help them to be able to do better, right? I've been teaching two programs. When they get to pointers, they just get to confuse it. Okay, so pointers is always that part of the program when people are just like, what is going on? So I said, okay, why don't we just make this vision, right? So what we did was we proposed a way to use graph transformation to help it become more visual, to help people understand pointers. So that's what we really focused on for this. Um, okay, so that's what I'm going to talk about. So what I'm going to go through is a, a, base, a brief introduction, a little background. Obviously here, you guys do know about graph transformation, so I don't need to go through that in detail. But of course, there may be people who are listening who don't know too much. So at least I'll give a little bit of a overview of what we use in the tools that we use to be able to implement this. Then we actually see a mapping to the pointer manipulation using graph transformation. Then I'll do a demo using the group tool to represent how we did it in my actual class. Because I actually implemented it in my C program class in spring. So I really rushed it to make sure I got it ready <laughs> right at the last minute to make sure it was in time for this paper. So. It was tested out in my class, and I compared it to the spring of the previous year to see what was the impact. Did it really help them compared to the students that didn't have the graph transformation view of it? Okay, and then 
We have the actual evaluation results from doing that. And then we'll talk about some related work for the existing ones who, who try to teach people how to do um, pointers and also other methods that do use graph transformation with pointers. And then we have conclusions and of course future works because this is very much the beginning of talking about um, using graph transformation with pointers. So I literally just started working on this just you know, a couple months ago. So I do want to go more and more in depth with this and see how this goes. And I'm definitely going to be doing this again in fall. And I'm going to really try it, especially for the feedback from today, and see how it is with my classes and the bigger classes, see how it is. Okay, so let's get into this. Like I said, here's the introduction. So there's different learning styles. Is it working? Okay. So there's different learning styles that are available. Okay. Of course, with learning styles, we have visual and non-visual. So the one, of course, we're going to focus on is the visual learning style because. The visual one is the one where you have pictures, you have even just PowerPoint slides as a visual one. But then we can have really dynamic ones such as simulation as a visual one. So we want to kind of see how the advantage of using those type of learning styles to help you when you're doing yeah. pedagogy. So the pedagogy, like I said already, is a pedagogy for graph transformations used for model and simulating how to do all this stuff. And we're going to focus on pointer manipulations on C. And then what we're going to also see is the effect of the actual assessment, which I said already. How well did this really work when we actually tested it out? So the book. I do have it in my bag, but I can show you guys later if you have any questions. So it, it is a really good book. It actually was written by one of my colleagues. So we use this as our C program and book. It's an excellent book and it's using University of New Haven to teach computer science. And this computer science course that I'm focusing on is a first year course. And this is their first program in language. So you have to keep that in mind. So they're not going into the high level of doing pointers. It's just an introduction. So this is the first time they saw it. So if you're going to notice some of the part of our models, it's not going so much into depth because of the fact that this is the first time they saw it and we don't want to scare them off too early, right? Because you know how people were just entering programming and they just, the first year is the, is the time when you lose half the class, right? So anyways, we want to make sure we just kind of teach them, get them a good view of it. So I said that part already. That's my colleague right there. Well, actually, all of them are colleagues from the university, so we tend to just use this book. They really like this book a lot. And I do recommend it because the way this book is, it's structured in a way so that you start it off, you can teach people C, and then after it, it literally goes into C++ and it just builds up. And it has, it does have visual stuff, but not at the level that I really wanted to get to in my class. Of course, again, our focus is C pointers, but the way the curriculum is for this course that I'm particularly focusing on is, C pointers is taught at the end for obvious reasons. So it slowly, slowly, slowly builds up and we only get to it literally at chapter 12. So it's at the end of the semester when they do see it. Um, so you're gonna see, again, we're not gonna go into a lot of detail. It's just a, a brief introduction into C pointers because in their higher years, they're gonna see pointers again. And of course, we're gonna connect it all to graph transformation systems. And you guys, I'm assuming, have a general idea, graph transformation rules, have that whole if-then structure, that understanding of having those constraints. And we're gonna see a bunch of examples of that. So I'm not gonna to spend too much time on the background of graph transformation. And the tool we're using as our aid is the group tool. All right, so we got to the introduction, we got to the background. Now let's actually get into the meat of the things how this all works together with the pointer manipulation using um, graph transformation. So we're gonna talk about brief parts of it. We have the type graph, the graph constraints, the graph transformation rules, and we have the map into the C pointers, which is what I really use to show the students the connection to how that visualization is with the graph transformation, and then the instance graph. So here is our type graph. So this type graph shows you the different components. Now, as you guys know, it's very 
brief type graph because we're not going into those high levels of pointer, but it still, still has all the different components. We have the pointer, the pointer points to the actual address, right? So the address is where it's going to be referencing. Now, if, for example, it's an array, or even if it isn't, you have the, the addresses connected together with like more of a succession. It's a connection next to each other back and forth, right? So that's where we have this one here. This address is going to be contained in some kind of object. So the object is contained could be like an int, a char, or even another array. Now, obviously, this is a very general look. And in future works, we're going to extend this to be able to represent a lot more. But this is a general idea to give the students an idea of the pointers. Okay? But it's enough to be able to show them how pointers work, because they need to understand the separation of the pointer to the address to the container. That was really the idea, because that connected it all together when you tell students initially was a really hard part for them to get that point. Now, this is the graph transformation constraints. With the graph, graph transformation constraints, our goal was to make sure that obviously it was valid, right? Making sure that we create proper representations of the pointers to make sure that we don't have invalid definitions of the pointer. So we make sure that, for example, array it points to a pointer, right? So that's that first connection. And then we also make sure, again, if the array is pointed to a pointer, we don't, it's not pointed to multiple kind of things. But we'll talk more about that stuff later if you have questions. So kind of skip into it stuff. I want to make sure I get into the simulation time. And then we also have the idea of making sure we have this pointer pointed to the address. So so we have pointer referencing the address. And you also have to consider the fact we have this free in here. So free equals to true. So if free equals to true, then obviously that doesn't really make sense, right? Because if, if it's assigned, we don't want that to occur. So we, that's a negative application condition. So you want to prevent certain things from occurring. Another one here is the pointer to the reference of address saying that, okay, it's not containing an actual Objects. So we have a negative application on the objects. Okay. Now let's get to the meat of the graph transformation rules. There's a whole bunch of graph, transform graph transformation rules, but I'm going to just kind of go through them briefly again, just because of time. And I really want to make sure I get to this in a moment. All right. So the first one over here is the rule of saying, okay, say we want to copy the value out of an object to existent int. So already we have a pointer that's pointing to an address that contains some kind of value. Then we have an int over here, but you want to get that value outside of it. So this one is going to use that value and then that value from this one is going to go to another one. And again, it's going to make a lot more sense when we do a demo because right now it's kind of abstract. And if you didn't notice, group combines the left-hand side and the right-hand side together. So you can see the creation of that new value assignment is shown in green. So they use color notification for the change, okay? Now, another one is simple rules here, just a creation of the ints and creation of the swing. So it's just a creation of those particular nodes. These ones are when it starts to get more interesting. Okay. Now, Say you have a thing, so say not null pointer is assigning an address to another one. So the pointer initially is pointing to something. That's why we have that blue. So it was really connected to something initially, but we're changing it to something else. So by changing something else, it's that re-representation, saying that now this pointer is pointing to another thing. But it's not just changing another thing, it's pointing to an existing one. So it's pointing to one that happened already has a point to represent it to it. So that's that mapping that we have here. Does that make sense? That teacher thing in me is coming into it. Sorry, right. <laughs> do the teacher too much. All right, so then we have this one here, null pointer. So this is a case where you have a null pointer where there is no pointer over here. Now, over here is pointed to another address. And then so, it's basically just a pointer sitting around. It's not connected to nothing. But now it's pointing to one that already has a pointer pointing. 
Here's another one. Pointer is assigned to. Sorry. Yeah. Just to be sure that uh, yeah. correctly. So this is the consultant as a bit of rules yeah. where you have the green part is the green one. Yes. The the red and obviously the negative is the condition. Yeah. And the blue one are the negative. Yes. The blue blue part is the perfect. And the black one is the it's the different phase. You got it. Okay, yeah. Just to just to be sure. Yeah, since we are talking about constraints, also do you assume the dangling condition? Yeah, so we we, we do. Yeah. Okay. Wait, so this one over here is pointer is assigned to a new address. So it's making sure the address is not the same. So that's why this is the not condition over here. And then it's saying it originally is pointed to this address and now it's pointing to a new. And then we have this one here saying a null pointer is assigned to address of an array. So this pointer is pointed to nothing because we have that negative application condition in red. And then the pointer is now newly pointed to an array. So we have that array point that first I talked about at the beginning. And this is the address of the array. The next one is a pointer is assigned to an int. So here's a pointer. We're changing the value from the free false to free equals to. True. I mean, I said it's opposite because the, the changes the, the green. So that it goes to green. So obviously, you're now assigning it. And then the containing, so you're adding the green, gets attached to the int. And then you're ensuring the negative application condition that, that one doesn't have an address already. The next one here is a null pointer. But the part that really represents the null pointer is the fact that the negative applica application condition on the address here. And then we're saying, we're now saying it's assigned to address of it. Uh, I should have put it. <laughs> so anyways, you have the pointer, you have the address, and you have the containment. And the containment is that part and title options. All right. Now we're going to talk more about the mapping to the seat pointers. So when I teach my students how to do this stuff, I first have to kind of go over what Graph Transformation Institute is, because obviously they don't know what it is. So I give them a very general kind of lecture in the review session about Graph Transformation, and then I map it to the basic C components. So the C components, as you guys know, has different operations, right? It's notation, I should say. So they have this particular one, like the AND. And of course, the AND returns the address of the object. We also have the asterisks. And that is to get the decorations. And also returns the objects of the address for the reference of by a pointer. Now, we have to map that to what we just saw with the graph information. Okay? So in this picture here, if I was to have pointer, like define as int star pt. So let me define a pointer of int type. And I'm saying the and of pt is that, that part here. So I circled it in red. And that's that and. Okay. Now, if I wanted to represent just pt itself, or and of t, you have the and of t up there, and you have the address of that. I'll start with that one, I'll start right. And then if I wanted to get the value, so say the value in here is 30, and I want to assign it to T, I would put an asterisk for PT to assign that, and that would be that one circled here. So that was kind of how I was trying to show the students how to connect it to C programming. Okay. Now we're finally at the instance graph. So the instance graph, as you guys know, is the start of how the graph is. The code that I'm starting with is just saying, okay, we have int s equals to zero, int t equals to zero, we have our array, and we have two pointers. So we have the two ints, s and t. We have the two pointers that at this point are null pointers and not pointing to anything yet. We have the array defined pointing to the array with successions 
um, connected together. And then we have all the values for each of those components. Now let's find the final part. So I'm going to switch over to the demo. But in order to do the demo, I'm going to write the code over there because I won't be able to show you two things at the same time. But I've been thinking about how I'm going to have that. So I'm going to just write it quickly and then I will show you. If you have questions, it's possible to have to take the down here and pop it That doesn't work. We try to figure out what's wrong there, but it's wrong. But there is a couple of spaces here for the front. Maybe move all back. Like All right, so this is Groove. So let me first show you the type graph that's, that is in here. That's a type graph that I just showed you guys that is encoded in here, um, just as you guys saw already. Okay. This is the instance graph. Just trying to figure out how to stand here without being in the way of the camera. And the first thing we want to do is s star um, s equals to star h, which is basically the first element in our array in this particular case. This is the particular mapping that I need to do to be able to do that one, which is going to be this particular graph transformation rule. As you can see over here, S is that int here, and it's going to get that value. That's in the array. Does that make sense? I keep saying this, that makes sense. I'm so used to teaching. I gotta stop doing that. Forgive me for that teacher mood. Okay. That's the first one. Okay. So the next one we wanna do is age p equals to h. The rule that I'm going to use is this particular rule here. So you see pointer HP and it's pointing to the age one here. So 
So now it's pointing to that same address. So, so far we got two steps done already. Now we're gonna to go to the next one, which is age P equals to ampersand of H. So as you guys know, we count from zero. So it goes um, zero, one, two, three. So we want this one to point to that one. The rule is this one we saw up here. And then we wanna change it to this one here. And then the last one that we're gonna see in this demo is star max P equals to T. So we're gonna be using this particular graph transformation rule. Max P is here. And we want it to point to this one, but we need the existing address. So it's gonna be using that address over here. And that's a little mini demo. All right, so let's go back to the slides so we can finish this up. All right, so let's talk about the evaluation. So like I said earlier, the evaluation is really about what really happened when I did this. In order to evaluate this, like I said, we just did this in the spring course. Unfortunately, spring course was a small course because it, usually we get a bigger load of people taking the first year course in the fall. So it was a smaller session. So I didn't really have a big amount of people to test it on but it's still at least I was able to test it. So that was the good part of it. So the improvement did show in comparison to um, the spring of the prior year, because obviously I didn't use this at all. I just used a regular textbook and I just asked them the regular same questions. Well, keep my life simple. I, I gave them literally the same questions that from the previous year. So it was, it kind of worked out for me. So I did the same question and I compared the results to see if it, if it was any different. So there was a difference. But of course, I want to make sure I spend more time with the students in the future so that I can really give them a chance to one, play with the tool, understand it so they can get more time. And so that I, I don't rush it in the review session opposed to, um, like, like I say, if I push all the lecture material earlier and leave more space for pointers, this would be a fun exercise at the end of the semester that I do want to plan for future. Okay. <laughs> So I did also use a value added score to kind of make sure it was a fair representation of the students that were done. So, you know, by looking at the grades, comparing it to the existing ones, making sure it was a balance to see. So there obviously could be other factors that could also affect their ability and understanding of pointers. This was some responses when I asked the students just from their perspective, if it did help them understand. Because when I remember the first day when I asked them, um, so you guys get this pointer stuff and they that blank face that students give you was basically what I got. But then when I showed it with graph information, they did like a little bit more, but of course, some of them still had that blank face because a lot of people don't like pointers. That's the problem with pointers, right? But it, it, it did help them. There was some people that really enjoyed it. Of course, you always have that mix of responses and not everybody responded to that particular questionnaire that I gave out. So that was one thing to keep in mind. Now for related works. Now there are 
other people out there who also are trying to figure out ways to help people who don't know pointers, okay? Um, there's this one we're using the value trace approach where they basically give people questions and get them to do it. But they do it at a different level of abstraction. They go into more of the high level that I'm not focusing on. Um, so you see different ways and methods that do it, okay? And they also use a lot of the traditional methods in their version to get people to understand pointers. Okay. Um, there also is one that uses a hydraulic press and that's their method of doing it, but it's more for industry. Obviously it's not specific for my students because my students are cybersecurity and computer science students. So obviously I'm not using that, but my uh, method is really for everybody, right? So that's a big difference. There's one that's actually a game, which is pretty cool, but the game is not the same type of visual that mine is. It's actually a, bit, a game where you see it more of, it's, it's not like, it doesn't break down the pointers, right? It's more of like, kind of like a video game and then it asks you questions. So it's, it's not really the same level of visualization that we intend to do with graph information. Okay? So different level of abstractions with the visual. It uses real world metaphors such as robots, right? So obviously a robot doesn't really represent a pointer the same way that we're trying to represent it here. And there is people who are using graph information to use for instance such as shape analysis, but their method is for something else. Like obviously our approach is for teaching primar primarily, so it has different focus. They are really focused on verification of pointers in the programs itself. So there is there is existing methods out there. So it's not like it's, it's not completely new. I didn't make this up, but it is existent. So it's good to know that's also. And for conclusions and related works, like I said earlier. Um, we are intended on extending the type graph to be able to represent size and memory. Currently, it is limited to showing memory in terms of just one, but of course, memory is not like that. Memory is represented based on different types and everything. So it's, it's not a full representation of how memory is represented at this level. So it's, it was just shown very basic because the students were not at that level to even know how the memory worked. But of course, maybe we can have one type graph that's more suitable for like the intro class and then another type graph that's more suitable for like the C++ class, like somebody that is at a higher level. So I can always separate the ideas at that point. And then we need to be able to test effectiveness again, like I said earlier, on a bigger class. So my class on in fall is gonna be 50 students. So that's gonna be a good size and I'm gonna test it out. So I, I'm thinking either I could give one class 25 the method one out the method but deep down I really want to give them all the method and see how it goes and then compare them to my fall of previous which is another 50 students who did not have it so that will give me another really good comparison plus they're at the same level because fall students come in with higher grades than the spring students the spring students are usually the people who are retaking the course so already it's not a good factor <laughs> at all. So usually it's like, okay, we're doing a retake students and stuff like that, because are there the people with the mad math grades and stuff like that? So we had, it, it was a harder group to work with, but the fall students are a better batch to be able to test this out, definitely. Um, then extended the approach for, for revision and delivery, of course, like I said already, I do want to change my curriculum push everything over to make sure that I have more time for pointers. And if students time to do simulations, thank you Eric, for your time. Thanks, okay. Can they expose to first year students? So do they show some room models and groups to students? It's 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 graph. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, do I do I expose this to the yeah. first year students? Yeah. Like so, graph information is not usually exposed. But what I do is I, I make sure I, I teach it to them to be able to be able to do this. So, but 
as long as you have the basic understanding of graph information, then I think it's enough for them to be able to use, utilize it. It means that the students should really understand GD and C. So uh, I'm wondering, uh, maybe maybe for GT is more abstract and it's good, but uh, maybe like, the students are just first year, yeah, most students like the GT is not like, quite accessible. Yeah, I understand what your concern. So what I do is I don't test them on graph transformation. I just still focus on like a pointer. So for example, after they do all this, their questions that they have on their test is the exact same level of questions that they would have before. So this is just to aid their learning and understanding. And then they go back to the same very basic pointer questions like, okay, I give you some code. Now, could you put the asterisk at the right spot? Could you put the ampersand at the right spot? Like it's so basic, but this is just to, for them to understand that visualization and that separation of, of knowledge. And then later write the C programs, do they actually do things like checking there are no dangling pointers? Nope. At this point, there's, there's, there's so... Because the neural model, the graph transform, just assumes that, right? We check the dangling pointer. But with pointers, it's not obvious that we check there are no dangling pointers. Yeah, so because this course is so, so like intro for the pointer, this is basically at the point where they don't need to program too much in the pointer, they're, ah, just, they're doing the basic, basic pointer. Right. Yeah. If you were to teach Rust, for instance, mm -hmm. which had the notion of ownership, uh, what do you think? Uh, could you represent easily the notion of ownership in graphs? Or my answer for everything is you can use graphs for everything. <laughs> I just love it. Like, I model everything with graphs, so I can I can, I can somehow pick, like I, like my PhD, for example, I, I model pharmacies with graphs. So like technically, I think graphs can be used to model basically any single thing. As long as you just break it down, see the abstract of it, and then you can build it up like in any certain way. So I think it is very much possible. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your very interesting talk. Uh, a quick question regarding uh, what the students are actually using and what they are giving. So I assume they are given the rules, the transformation rules for the operators, and they're given like a instance, a graph instance for the, the state before the model is executed. And then did I ask you correctly that I just apply the rules? Or? So what I did was to keep it really simple for the students, I actually did a simulation for them. So um, I showed them the, a very general demographic information and I worked through the simulation for them. For future, I'm going to let them play around with it if they want so they can see and understand it more. But at, at the time, they didn't even have the rules. They didn't have anything because um, I just wanted them to just get the brief understanding this is how the pointer is, this is what an address is, this is how you separate it. Because right when that separation comes, people are just like, what just happened? Everything was just a variable and a value. And now you're telling me something more. Why is there a star? Why is there an and? So it was more just getting that general understanding across. That was really what I did. So they didn't, they weren't given much, but then what I did was after I gave them the simulation, after I gave them the lecture, I gave them the recording of the lecture, I gave them of course the slides and everything to be able to review. So if they wanted to kind of see it over and over again, they did have that chance to see that visualization again. I think that's a really big short follow-up. So in future, you would probably, if you let students use it, then provide them a basis where the, the understanding of graph information is not required in depth, but they could just have this visualization of how an uh, operator applied in a You got it. Yeah, right. just like, like a crash course in graph information. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Model of the domain you want to represent, 
and in this case it was pointers and addresses and and the kind of link between them but if you're interested in ownership then you need i mean the parties who are potentially the owners of things and maybe connections between the parties and the things that are owned to add that to your conceptual model in a sense uh, uh it's, it's a bit like visualizing or, or representing these things in meta model but then you also have to the possibility to create an instance of it and animate it so that's essentially what you're getting and how good the kind of meta model or, or kind of instance of the meta model representation is for ownership i mean it's it's, it's eventually the abstract syntax of ownership it's not actually uh, uh, uh showing how ownership is represented in rust so so if, if it gets too complicated, of course, if there are too many concepts, then, then, then maybe the graph isn't a good representation either, then you need a kind of concrete, sort of more diagrammatic form. Yeah? But in general, that, that would be the, the, the approach. And yeah. then, well, that's first question here, sorry, Maximilian. That's a question. So I really like your um, animation. way, kind of an easy way to um, automatically generate such an animation from so if a colleague wants to use it in this class, for example, that he can use with four or five lines of symbols, and the tool generates the application. Yeah, the, the tool does do a lot of um, automatic part of it, but then the question is, which rule do you want it to match? Because oh, okay. like, it's more that rule matching, right? Because it's so, so many rules are there, and then which matching do you want? So it's for individual rules, it's yeah. not really derivations, which are... Well, there was one one more question that we have. <clears throat> so, so you talk about understanding programs, right? and there is something semantic for it. You have been developing operational semantics, mutational semantics, operational logics. Uh, so, why is what is the problem there, or how does it seem to be consistent? The reason why is I'm just trying to find a visual way just to simplify things. That's really why I find, like, I'm not trying to place what's out there, obviously. I'm just trying to simplify just it from the teaching perspective. How do you make it so that somebody who's just first into programming gets to something that's a really complex concept and visualizes it in so graphic? It's like, it's like a simplification of some operational semantics. Yeah. Wouldn't it like to show that it's actually a system? Well, that may be a nice follow up course. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. yeah, I think it could link to higher of class, uh, you know, later year courses. I mean, sure. uh, as Roa mentioned, uh, shape analysis and all this stuff, you could end up with really sophisticated analysis stuff working with graph transformation techniques to statically analyze model programs. That would be kind of ideal scenario. But, but you're right. I mean, the, the one way of putting it would be to say there is a simple, incomplete, Operational semantics, yeah, where the state of the program is represented by a graph. Um, and that is essentially used for visualization at the moment, uh, but certainly can be in principle related to complete operational semantics and, and uh, the actual code as well, which probably is. Okay, it's nice to see this lively discussion, but I think in the interest of the coffee break, we should have a question on the chat. Oh, sorry. Uh, I can't read this. So can you see it? That's about the simulation part. Okay, this is a specific question. About the max P. Is it possible to answer that quickly? <laughs> And I suggest that we take that offline. Yeah. Maybe you can answer okay. that in the chat. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. 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 Thanks.